ready to learn how to make a loaf of yeast bread. This is my grandfather's Russian round bread recipe, and we are going to learn how to make it. So get ready to take a bite out of bread making. Hey, advanced food students. We are gonna learn how to make some bread today. Have you ever smelled the amazing sense of homemade fresh baking bread, whether it's in the bakery at the grocery store, or maybe your parents or grandparents or somebody that you've known has made bread or cinnamon rolls or pizza dough. We're gonna learn how to make a basic yeast dough today. Uh, the recipe that I'm gonna be using is my grandfather, Gail Rowland's Russian round bread recipe. And I love this recipe. It makes a big gigantic loaf. Um, and he used to do a braid at the top and do some decorations. We're just gonna do a basic um, two loaves of bread. Um, so I'll show you how that comes together. And we're also gonna be reviewing some basic units of measurement and how to measure certain items. So let's get started. So this recipe starts with two cups of warm milk. When you're making a yeast bread, which yeast bread by you know its name uses yeast as the leavening agent, you wanna use warm water or in this case, milk. Um, I like to just pop it in the microwave for about a minute, 30 seconds. And when you're talking about warm, you want your warm to be about 100 degrees or the equivalent of say shower or bath water. If you can stick your finger into your milk and it kind of is uh, you know, a little bit too hot, this is actually a little bit hotter than I would like right now, so we're gonna let it cool down as I chat. Um, if you can't really hold your finger in there for a long time, mine's just slightly above that temperature. We're getting down a little bit there. If, if you can't hold your finger in there for a long period of time, it really is too hot. And what happens to your yeast, yeast is basically a living thing and that's what basically expands to make your yeast bread. Um, if you put the yeast into a liquid that is too hot, it's actually gonna kill your yeast. But the problem is that if you don't have it hot enough, then your yeast is not going to activate and get foamy and actually do what it needs to do in your yeast bread, which is make that yeast bread rise and be nice and fluffy and airy. So with yeast, let's chat a little bit about yeast here and dry, um, I'm sorry, measuring spoons. So if you remember from basic foods, we have a ta tablespoon measure and we have several types of teaspoons. Um, one tablespoon is also equivalent to three teaspoons, which is gonna be helpful whenever figuring out how much of this jarred yeast to use. Just to let you know with yeast, there is a, um, a date at the top of your yeast, or if you have packages of yeast, it'll be labeled on your package of yeast. If your yeast is not in date, it probably isn't gonna work anymore. So sometimes over time, yeast loses its potency or it really isn't gonna you know, make for that rising action for you. So you make sure that you check the date. And another way to lengthen your time of, of yeast life is popping it into the refrigerator or even the freezer. So th that actually gives you about six more months of yeast life, if you will. So we are gonna be using what is equivalent to two packages of yeast today. One package of yeast is two and one quarter teaspoons. So since I'm using two packages of yeast for this particular recipe, I'm gonna be using um, four and a half teaspoons. So since I know that, let me do this over the garbage can here, I don't wanna do it over my bowl because I might get too much. And actually my tablespoon doesn't really fit into that jar. So we are gonna be using one tablespoon and then four and a half teaspoons because the one tablespoon is equivalent to three teaspoons. So it kind of saves you a little bit of work. Um, if you were more concerned about doing dishes, you could just do four individual teaspoons. So I'm gonna go ahead and let me feel this again. I think that feels like a really good temperature. So I'm gonna say that's about the, you know, 100 degrees or so. So I'm gonna add my yeast in, four and a half teaspoons or two packages of yeast. I'm gonna put the lid on that so I don't get anything in there. And then also to this, I'm gonna add a half a cup of sugar. Make sure whenever you're um, doing dry ingredients that you level off, use a dry measuring cup and level it off with the back of a knife um, or the back of a spatula. And what sugar does with these, it actually kind of, ooh, this is getting to be a little bit too full. Let me grab a bowl here. Didn't think I was gonna have some overflow, but you know, that's real life. Clean that up there. There we go. That works a little bit better. Clean that up. All right, 
So sugar is going to actually help activate your yeast a little bit more. Salt can kill your yeast. So I recommend that if a recipe has salt in it, that you mix it with the flours instead. So you just wanna take a whisk and a spoon really is not gonna work for this. A spoon doesn't really cut through all of those little clumps of yeast that end up in there. So you really wanna get some whisk action in there. I'm gonna say worst case scenario, if you don't have a whisk, you can use a fork, um, but a whisk is really gonna be your best tool. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let this hang out for about five minutes or so until our yeast gets nice and foamy. Um, that's another way that you know that your yeast is ready to use if you see foaminess up on the top and I'll show you what that looks like in a couple minutes. While we're letting our yeast um, proof, it's called what it's called, proofing your yeast, let me get that little batch of sugar in there. Proofing your yeast, we are going to talk about measuring. So I do have two cups of flour in my stand mixer here. And if you don't have a stand mixer, you can do this just in a regular mixing bowl if you want to. Stand mixer works really nice because we have something called a dough hook, which we're gonna use in a little bit. I have the regular paddle on here. If you're doing it in a big bowl, you can just use a wooden spoon. Um, you don't necessarily need the fancy stand mixer to, to you know, make this recipe work. So I have two cups of flour in here. I do need one more, and I did wanna review with you how to measure flour. Um, remember that when you're measuring things like flour, um, powdered sugar, uh, you wanna spoon it in and kind of bring that to the top, just like that. You want it to be heaping. And then you're gonna take the back of a butter knife and you're gonna level that off just like that. You want it to be exact. Don't pack down your flour. That actually gets more flour into your cup than you want. But if you are measuring ingredients like say brown sugar, you do wanna pack that into a measuring cup because it's moist and you wanna make sure that you have the precise amount. So we're gonna add to this our extra one cup of flour. So in total, I have three cups of all-purpose flour. You can do whole wheat, things like that if you want to. And then we are going to use our salt in this area right here. So we're gonna mix it in with our flour because again, salt can kill your yeast. When you are pouring over a, um, a, me a measuring spoon, you can also use the back of a butter knife to level that off, just like that. Um, but make sure that you're not pouring directly over your bowl because sometimes you get too much salt in there and if you get it in there, you've already used it and it's, it's too late. You, you, you add too much of that spice or baking powder or salt to that particular mixture and, and then it doesn't taste very good. So, all right, we got two tables, two teaspoons, I'm sorry, two teaspoons or two small teas of salt. Um, I'm going to go ahead and mix that together and that actually does the work for me, which is really nice. So I'm gonna let this mix here, and I think that's pretty good. And I'm going to let this yeast proof, and I'll show you what it looks like in a second. So this is what our proof yeast looks like. If you notice, it kind of has like a foamy texture to it. This is how you know that your yeast is ready to go. All right, our yeast is proofed, and what we're gonna do is we are gonna add that into the um, basin of our stand mixer. Um, basic breads are always going to have a, uh, or basic yeast breads, I should say, are always going to have yeast, some type of liquid, and some type of flour. So we're going to go ahead and get, turn that on. Um, other things that we're going to use in this recipe, we're going to use two eggs in this recipe. If you remember from basic foods, um, one egg is equivalent to a quarter of a cup. Typically, we use large eggs in recipes, and if you had jumbo eggs or medium eggs, you can actually crack them into a measuring cup and measure out one quarter of a cup if indeed you needed, um, say, a quarter of a cup of eggs or half cup of eggs or two eggs or something. You would know that you would need a half a cup or a quarter cup, depending on how many you needed. Make sure that you crack your eggs into a separate bowl to avoid shells getting into your batter. Don't crack it right into the batter because then if you get shells in there or it's like a bloody egg, um, you might have to end up starting again. So make sure that you crack your eggs into a separate bowl. Make sure you wash your hands after you crack those eggs. Um, another thing that we're gonna be adding to this mixture here, and I'm gonna get my eggs, and I'm gonna stop this here, and plop my eggs in there. And then we are also going to be adding some melted butter. If you remember from Basic Foods, butter comes in stick form usually. You can get it in a tub. Um, but it comes in stick form and there's eight tablespoons per stick of butter. And a stick of butter is also equivalent to a half a cup. 
So if you needed one cup of butter, you would need two sticks of butter. In this particular recipe, we're using two tablespoons of butter. So I already cut that off and I stuck it in my bowl here and I had that melted. Um, with butter, always follow what the recipe says. So if it says softened butter, uh, it's just gonna be room temperature butter. If it says melted butter, you can uh, microwave it or um, put it over the stove if you needed to. Uh, if it calls for cold butter, like for pies, you definitely wanna use cold butter because there's a the, the element of coldness allows you to cut that in really easily to your flour and allows you to have a dough that will release those elements and kind of allow that butter to melt. Um, so in this case, we are using two tablespoons of melted butter and you can feel free to get your spatula in there to scrape out any butter that is remaining in that bowl there. So now we're gonna mix this in here, our butter and our eggs. And at this point, we are going to be adding the rest of our flour. Now, I measured out here four cups of flour. The recipe calls for seven and a half cups because we're probably gonna use the extra half a cup um, a little bit later in the recipe. So as you get your eggs and your butter all nice and combined in there, we are going to, and I already spooned this in, so it's already pre-measured for four cups. I'm gonna gently add in a little bit at a time my cups of flour. And what we're looking for is the point in which that dough starts to come together and make a ball. So I'm gonna add a little bit more and I'm gonna say that's gonna happen around like six cups or so. So right now we have in this bowl five cups because I've added roughly two more cups to that original three cups of flour. And sometimes you might need, you might see a lot of stuff stuck on the sides of your bowl. You can use your spatula, but by no means should you take your spatula and stick it into your stand mixer. That's a no-no. That, that is a recipe for breaking your beautiful stand mixer. So if you need to do that, feel free to take, um, you know, turn your, your mixer off. Go ahead and scrape down the sides of your bowl if you need to. And then you can kind of scrape off your uh, spatula there. Put your lid down. I'm just gonna do a slow speed here and then continue. So I'm gonna add one more cup of flour here. Just kind of do it gently. You can uh, turn down the speed if you need to. Uh, I like a low speed because otherwise it just shoots everywhere and then you're like, uh, you know, in a snowstorm of flour. So if you notice that it, this is starting to lift up, this is the point in which I'm gonna switch out to my dough hook. So I'm gonna turn my mixer off and there is a way to stop that, which I'll show you in just a second. So I'm gonna take my batter here and I'm gonna get this all scraped off and then I will be back to show you what we're gonna do next. Let's attach our dough hook now. So I swapped out for the paddle and I'm attaching the dough hook. And what the dough hook does, it basically does the work of kneading for you. So we're gonna turn that on and we are going to add a little bit more flour. Now, as I had said, this is kind of like hopping up a little bit. There is a lock, which you can't see where you're at, but there's a lock where that will actually hold it in place. So I just set that lock. And at this point, our dough hook is starting to knead and also give us a, a shower here. I'm gonna actually let that go for a few minutes. It does take a couple minutes for it to knead in that extra flour that we've added. And also in regards to flour, it will, your dough will take on more or less flour actually depending on the weather. So if it's a very moist day, it might take on more flour. If it's a really dry, hot day, it may take less flour. So the environment and the humidity and the temperature outside actually affects how your dough reacts to um, the flour that it's taking on inside. You know, you wouldn't imagine that it would, you know, temperature and weather outside would affect the inside setting, but it actually does. So if you notice here, our dough is starting to come together, but it's, it's still kind of sticking to the sides of the bowl. So if it's sticking to the sides of the bowl, you do need to add a little bit more flour. And that's one way that we know that our, our dough has enough flour. I'm gonna go ahead and add the rest of that there. If your dough is no longer sticking to the sides of the bowl, you do not need to add any more flour. I like to give it a minute or so before I determine that I'm done adding flour because sometimes it just takes a couple minutes for it to suck up and, and kind of integrate more of that flour. So at this point, we are now in the kneading process and dough, bread dough yeast doughs need to knead for five to eight minutes. 
whether it's done in a stand mixer or whether it's done by your hands. I'll show you how to knead um, in a couple minutes after um, this needs for about five to 10 minutes. I'll show you here on the counter how to finish that up and how to actually do the kneading process by hand. Our dough has been kneading for about six minutes or so and what you're looking for is your dough to be nice and smooth. Now with a stand mixer, it's it might be a little bit separated because you're gonna have to take it off of the hook, but we are going to be, and you take your dough hook off here, pop that into the sink. And we have one more amount of kneading to do before we let this dough rise. So what I did here is I floured my surface with that extra half a cup. I don't quite have half a cup here, but I did um, measure out a half a cup with, that was remaining in the recipe. So when you're kneading, okay, and if you're doing all kneading by hand, it's the same method that you're gonna follow here as um, if your stand mixer did some of the kneading for you. So when you knead, you're gonna push with the heel of your hand, turn it 90 degrees, fold it over, push with the heel of your hand, fold it, turn it over, push with the heel of your hand. Now, if you notice that your dough is not sticking, you may not need all of this flour. So you can push, push with the heel of your hands, push with the heel of your hands, push, turn, fold, push, turn, fold, push, turn, fold, push, turn, fold. And you're gonna do that until, if you are hand kneading, until your dough is not sticking on the counter anymore. If you are hand kneading, you're probably gonna need a lot more flour than you see here. Um, with the stand mixer, it took all of my kneading, uh, all of my flour in during the kneading process. Um, that is the beauty of a stand mixer, it does it for you. So what you're looking for in the kneading process, after you've gone about five to eight minutes, is you wanna have a nice smooth ball. It should be as smooth as a baby's butt, as they say in the culinary world. So if you notice here, there's no big divots. Um, it's all a smooth ball. So at this point, we know that we have kneaded this enough and it is ready to do its first rise. So I took a bowl and you could actually use your mixing bowl as well. I greased it with some Pam and you're gonna put that in the bottom there. Make sure since, uh, since our dough had egg, um, I definitely wanna wash my hands here before I touch anything else. Give me a second to do that. Don't wanna spread salmonella poisoning anywhere. So make sure when you touch that batter, make sure you give your hands a good wash. I'm gonna grab my towel here. So what we're gonna do is we are going to cover this bowl with plastic wrap. You can also use a kitchen towel. And we're gonna set this just on the counter um, to rise to double its size. So this is gonna rise to basically, it's gonna come up to this plastic wrap here and it's gonna almost fill this entire bowl. It's gonna be about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. So we'll, I'll show you what it looks like whenever it's done with its first rise. Our dough is definitely doubled in size. I kind of forgot about it. I got a little distracted, but that's okay. So I'm gonna save this piece of plastic wrap because we're gonna use that again in just a few moments here. So this was our first rise and we want to punch this down. So got a really good rise and expansion on this dough. So we're gonna punch that down and kind of deflate some of that air out so that we can shape this into our bread loaves. So. What we're gonna do here is we are going to pull our loaves, or you can cut it with a butter knife or whatever. I'm just gonna pull it apart. We are going to pull our loaves into two pieces. I'm gonna lead, kind of knead together each one of these loaves. Now you can make with this recipe two loaves of bread or three loaves of bread. I am going to do two loaves because I like bigger loaves of bread. So shape those into a nice log as you can see right here i'm going to do the same thing with the other side my grandfather actually used to make he used to make some take some of the dough away and braid it and then he would do this big giant loaf um so it was actually a, a round loaf meaning russian round bread um, i like to do just the sandwich loaves so you can toast them or things like that so let me wash my hands real quick And now we are going to spray our, our loaf tins or bread pans because that's where our bread is going to go into and form and do a second rise. So I'm gonna take my pan here 
and just press that into the form of the loaf pan. And now we're gonna take that plastic wrap. I have one piece already done from the original rise. And we're gonna wrap that up again. And this is going to rise for another hour to an hour and a half. So this is what we call the second rise. Not all breads have a second rise, but if they do have a second rise, it's gonna be the rise in which they take their final shape. So once this bread is completely risen, then it's gonna go into the oven and bake, and we'll talk about the baking process in, in just a second. So in the meantime, find something to do. You can clean, you can do some canvas work, you can you know, do something around the house, take a nap, but this is the downtime to the bread, so we're gonna wait for the second rise. Our loaves have doubled in size for sure, and as you can see, these are gonna make for some really nice uh, loaves that you can make sandwiches with, or you can put toast, uh, turn them into toast with butter, jelly, so very carefully take off your plastic wrap. You don't want to rip it off real hard because it sometimes can deflate your loaf. Um, let's do the same thing to this one. Also try to not knock them around everywhere. Um, you want to try to be gentle with these because again, these have risen a lot and you want to keep that nice rise on your bread. So last step with bread. You don't have to do this with every bread, but this particular bread it looks so nice whenever you do an egg wash on it. Um, an egg wash is basically a beaten egg. As you see here, you just crack an egg, you beat it up with a fork. Um, some egg washes will have you add a little bit of water to thin it out. I just did the egg itself. But this is gonna make for a really nice golden crust. For those of you who remember from basic foods, we did an egg wash on top of our stromboli. Um, or you can do, you know, on top of different pastries and things like that. So I'm just gonna do, an. Again, do this very gently because you don't wanna deflate your bread. And again, this is an optional step. We're just gonna paint with our pastry brush, AKA a basting brush, a little bit of egg on the top and that is gonna make for a nice shiny top to our bread. Do the same thing for your second loaf. And again, if you don't wanna do this step, if you don't have a pastry brush, you don't have to do this. It's still gonna look really, really beautiful whether you do the egg wash or not. So my oven is preheated to 350 degrees. Breads typically bake a little bit lower than some other um, baked goods. You might see some that are baking at 325 or 350, but definitely just look at the recipe. Whatever the recipe tells you to do, you should follow that. So I'm gonna bake these for 30 to 40 minutes. I'm gonna check on them at 30 minutes because I can always add more time. You really can't take time away. So with this size, we're gonna be looking at about 30 minutes. So I'm gonna bake these and check them and then I'll show you how to check for doneness. All right, our bread is done and we have a nice, beautiful golden brown color on the top for both of our loaves here. Um, another test that you can do to see if it's done is to just knock on it. I don't know if you guys can hear that. It should sound hollow. So a hollow sound tells you that a loaf of bread, it's really hard to like look underneath and determine if it's done or not, but that hollow sound can help you determine if it's done or not. And then do not forget to turn your oven off once you are done baking, really important. Look at the inside of that bread. Woo, so good. Um, you want to let your bread cool down um, to about room temperature, slightly warm before you start to cut into it. Um, otherwise, you can kind of risk deflating your bread. Um, let me turn this around here. Oh my goodness. So excited to take a bite of this. Um, if you make extra bread, like two loaves, what you can do is, um, if you're trying to store it and you're not going to eat it right away, keep it in a sealed container. Uh, let it cool down completely. Don't put it in a container sealed while it's warm because then it can get soggy and you don't want that. Um, don't stick bread into the refrigerator. It actually gets staler faster. It does prevent the development of molds of some kind, but um, keeping it on the counter in a sealed container can help uh, your bread tastes really great for a long time. So I hope that you guys give this a try and I hope you enjoyed this video. Make some bread yourself. Woohoo!